Session 3. Eastern Partnership, an agent of democratic transformation. Moderator, Katarzyna Pisarska, founder and director, European Academy of Diplomacy, Poland. Speakers, Zohrab Natsakanyan, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Armenia. Tamar Chugoshvili, first deputy chairperson of the Georgian Parliament. Claudia Roth, Vice President of the German Bundestag. Kerstin Lundgren, Deputy Speaker of the Swedish Riksdag. N. Esma, Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Estonian Parliament. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to our after lunch session uh, on the Eastern Partnership and Agent of Democratic uh, Transformation. Let me start from a little uh, from a little explanation. Instead of Claudia Roth, which was here in the morning, we have actually Michael Roth, which is not family, as Claudia explained, as, and is the Minister of State for Europe at the Federal Foreign Office in Germany, also a member of, of uh, Parliament in Germany. So welcome. We know that your plane was uh, delayed and thus uh, this small change. But I also would like to welcome all the distinguished speakers. Uh, as you saw, we have a true uh, representation of both the European Union and the Eastern Partnership countries. And before we start, I have a small surprise we've just learned uh, about. Uh, we were supposed to be joined by the Prime Minister of Estonia, Yuri Rotas. But because he could not come, he has asked for a few minute speech uh, that he recorded uh, and uh, we are happy uh, to, uh, to show it to you now. Dear participants of the Batumi conference, I am sad that I cannot be with you today. At the same time, I am glad that I have this opportunity to address the conference digitally. It is notable that the 16th Patumi Conference is dedicated to the European Union's Eastern Partnership 10th anniversary. The roots of the Eastern Partnership are here in Georgia. We remember the events of 2008, which triggered the creation of the Eastern Partnership in Prague 2009, Russian aggression against Georgia and occupation of one part of its territory. The Eastern Partnership Summit in Brussels in 2017 during our presidency was businesslike and straightforward. It shows that the partnership has become more major and the focus is on serious cooperation. Something that I believe is a good for both the people of the EU and in Eastern partner countries. The Batumi Conference is an excellent platform to outline which next steps we would like to see. Looking back, we can say that the Eastern Partnership has been the most successful neighborhood policy of the EU. It has brought us closer to people via visa liberalization with the Ukrainians, Georgians and Moldovans and offers opportunities for young people from all six countries to study in the EU. Estonia has been the member of the Union for 15 years, reintegrating with the West after regaining the independence in 1991 was not easy. However, Europe and its values are deep in our hearts and we saw it as a unique opportunity and the only way forward. We committed to rule of law, democratic values and fundamental rights. This is the only way for sustainable reforms where citizens, visitors and business will benefit alike. Estonia's commitment to support Georgian independence and territorial integrity is strong and clear. We will continue to support our friends and Eastern partners in the integration process. I hope that your discussions will give a good opportunity to debate also how member states of EU will keep benefiting from Eastern partnership policy. 
I wish you a good and fruitful conference. Thank you very much, and I think uh, we can start the session now. We, of course, have a small challenge because we're directly after lunch, so it's, it's a good time to have a small nap. But we'll make sure to, make you, uh, to have you a bit entertained, but most important, inspired uh, and ready for further discussions. So let me start uh, with a short question uh, to our speakers uh, before I will uh, um, give back the floor to the audience uh, about the Eastern Partnership Initiative in terms of promotion of democracy. Do you believe that the initiative itself, that falls yet short from a promise of enlargement, an enlargement a promise that was so critical for Central Europeans, including my country, Poland, to really reform, really become democratic, does the lack of this enlargement perspective uh, allow the Eastern Partnership Initiative to be a true democracy promotion tool? And if yes, what kind of, uh, what kind of instruments does this initiative help have to help uh, the countries, the six countries, uh, truly move uh, and reform? Let's start maybe from our, uh, the Minister of Armenia, Zorab. Could you start? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think the conceptual approach, so far as Armenia is concerned, is somewhat different. Democratization is about Armenia. This is the most difficult point we have to make to everyone around us. In April and May 2018, Armenia has demonstrated the, the depth, the strength of the institutions which could absorb such a shock and move us to a very good level of, of, of uh, uh, de democratic progress. Uh, this was something that wouldn't happen overnight. Something that was building up over years. The institutions of the public, the civil society, all other institutions, the media, the, the state institutions, and so on and so forth. Our country has seen some very difficult moments in its history. We have the tragedy of 2008. We have other such trippings in the democratic progress. 2018 was a moment of, uh, you know, um, uh, a very important step forward. But all of this is about Armenia. Absolutely. Absolutely Absolutely nothing to do with geopolitics. And this is the most difficult point we have to make to all our partners. So Armenia, is EU relevant? But, is the relation but, with the EU relevant? But, but in, this in is where I'm coming promotion. to. Because this is all about values. And these are our values. Mm -hmm. The values that we chose to build our country when we became independent in 91. The model of a country. When we do a law in Armenia, we send it to not, not any commission in the world, but to the Venice Commission, for example because we want to check it against the European standards. The, it is in this context that the European Union throughout 27 years, 28 years, it has been one of the fundamental pillars of Armenia's security architecture exactly in that point, in the point of strengthening, instilling, uh, you know, the, the values that, and the capacity to pursue these values, which is institutional. You can have all the values, but if your institutions are not good enough, it will not work. So it is the, you know, the value of our relationship with the European Union that there have been participants in this through the consistent support and engagement in building the institutions to build you know, genuine strong democracy. Absolutely. Eastern Partnership in that sense is, is giving us that platform of a com sense of community. Because I think at the heart of it is the values. So the value of the Eastern Party is the auxiliary support to what we do at home through the sense of a community. That the six, as I was making the point earlier, it's not neighborhood, it's part of Europe. And it is the value-based relationship that we have. Absolutely, and the European Union is a community of values and is a community of, 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 of the mac democracies. Tamar, uh, do you think uh, that the EU is a strong, or the uh, integration with the European Union is a strong driving factor for reforms uh, here in Georgia? Um, thank you very much for the question. And um, my re an short answer would be that it's a um, two-way street. So it's both probably the key is indeed the will of the country and will of the people. Um, and um, Georgians have this 
decision made a long time ago that we want to be the part of the democratic world, we want to be the part of Europe, European Union, um, and the cooperation with the European Union definitely helps once nation has this kind of desire, once there is a willingness to be part of the democratic society, then this partnership, this cooperation is something that gives a huge value of uh, good advice, of technical assistance, of additional motivation, all sorts of uh, elements actually that help the country to be effective, to be successful on um, this transformation. For Georgia's, um, from Georgian experience, um, there have been, I do not want to go into the details of the mechanisms that have been out there from the EU side, but definitely there have been um, a lot, including association agreement, including the action plan for the uh, visa-free movement, and all these action plans have had a solid part on democracy, on democratic reforms, on respecting human rights. And um, these action plans, these um, elements in, um, on our, um, our aspirations, on the way of our meeting our aspirations, definitely have helped uh, Georgia to improve on so many um, different angles which are relevant to building democracy. Today, Georgia is ranking according to the, all the credible international assessments um, indicators, um, Georgia is ranking um, the most uh, successful in terms of comparing itself, like comparing to where we were seven years ago, ten years ago, we are moving forward in every component. So in rule of law and freedom of press and transparency and accountability, um, of and the you state think that institutions the EU has been an, and an important factor ab to this, absolutely this. absolutely and um, Georgia for example right now we are quite proud we are not only com we do not want to be compared to um, uh, only to the region but we also want to be compared to some of the sometimes even member states and on some of the issues for example on anti-corruption on um, freedom of media we are doing than, better than four or five member states even, or the candidate countries. Georgia does have this success and definitely the EU also had played its role. But beyond what is asked and demanded from the European Union and what is important, what is, uh, what is the carrot kind of, beyond that, we do also a lot. And the best example for that is the most relevant thing that is discussed in Georgian politics right now, it is the total shift and change in the political system, in the parliamentary election system, which will transform our country from one-party domination to very pluralistic political representation in the parliament. So this is something that nobody was asking. It was Georgian citizens who were asking. Absolutely. It was not European Union. It was the Georgian citizens who were asking. So this is why I'm saying that it's a two-way street. There should be a demand from the citizens, willingness of the nation, and then the um, partnership, the assistance, and this additional motivation that is coming from the Thank European you, Union is very Thank helpful. You. Very Thank good you. points and also very inspiring for Georgia. We probably he will hear more uh, about Georgia itself. But let me move a bit maybe to Berlin and the German perspective. Michael, I'm thinking about you. Uh, what is the end goal for Berlin of the Eastern Partnership Initiative? So when we started this uh, back in, well, first the European Neighborhood po Policy in 2003 and 4, and then 2009, the Eastern Partnership, the idea in Central Europe, in Poland, was that this is going to be a gateway for these countries to potential enlargement, to full accession to the European Union. Was that the, 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 the outlook in Berlin, and what is it now? Why do we need the Eastern Partnership Initiative, or do we? First of all, hello to everybody, and thank you so much for inviting me. It was a long and bumpy road to come to Batumi, but I'm very glad to be here. Um, and uh, my presence uh, illustrates the close partnership between Parliament and the German government. It's all about democracy. It's all about freedom. It's all about the rule of law. Um, the European Union is not just a single market or an economic project is first and foremost the union of common values and these values binds everybody. And 
peace, stability, democracy all over Europe is in our national interest and it's also in our EU's interest. And that's why we have been established the Eastern Partnership. It's not a second-class offer to our friends and partners in Eastern Europe. It's a more realistic approach. Because many, many people within the European Union are totally exhausted. They are confronted with so many problems, crises, conflicts and wars across the world. The Brexit, the transatlantic relations are totally under pressure. Migration, the rise of nationalism and populism, all these put a lot of pressure on the European Union and many people are not really happy with enlargement. And that's why we have to speed up. And it's all about civil society. I'm not quite sure if we discuss about the role of civil society in the whole process. It's not just an obligation for the political elite or for the economic elite. It's an obligation for civil society. And before I come to this place, I met civil society of representatives of civil society here in Georgia and they are really worried they are not they are very very disappointed about the current developments in Georgia but also in the European Union sometimes they feel we forgot them yeah. and that is the 1 million euro question is there a chance to empower civil society with the eastern partnership is there a chance to make clear that it's worth it? And we have just two options. The first option is we speed up the reform process in Eastern Europe, here in Georgia. And the second option is that the whole young generation leaves this country and come to the European Union or to Germans. This morning I met an intern who uh, works for the Foreign Ministry of Georgia, he told me that all his friends, all his friends, live, work and study in Germany. Mm -hmm. It's good for us, but this brain drain is a disaster for this wonderful, beautiful country. Well, ladies and gentlemen, a very clear message from Berlin. Let's speed up enlargement, if I hear correctly. And of course, civil society will come back. I know there's a number of members of civil society, not only from Georgia, but also from the European Union that wanted to speak. We'll give them uh, that opportunity. Now, let's move uh, to Sweden. Kirsten, your country has been incremental uh, in creating the Eastern Partnership uh, Initiative. And you yourself has been, have been a regular to this region. Uh, but my question to you would be, uh, the Eastern Partnership is, is an initiative that is fit for an, six countries that are in a completely different um, uh, road uh, and relations with the European Union and also different expectations. What would you tell to the other countries, not only Armenia and Georgia that we have here, but also to Belarus, to Azerbaijan, to their societies, what can the Eastern Partnership offer them? Well, uh, that's a question for themselves to decide. Which goal do they have for, for uh, themselves in the Eastern Partnership? Because uh, as uh, has been in the panels before, it is flexibility uh, in the Eastern Partnership. So it, it differs depending on uh, the context for every country. Uh, Georgia has uh, clear aspirations for, for a membership and uh, coming from the Swedish Parliament, I must say that uh, in the Swedish parliament there is a strong support uh, for, for the perspective of membership because that is what has been promised. Uh, if you uh, reach the goals, implement, not only decide, but implement uh, whatever has been taken on, uh, then you should be uh, able to start process for membership. Absolutely. Do you, do you think it, it, it should be perceived, just like Michael said, as a, as a strong democracy promotion tool, the Eastern Partnership? I, I think that's, the, that's the vision from the EU right I, now. I think there is a strong... I mean, we can, we can look in the region now. 
it's uh, it's clear that the interest from from uh, um, the EU members uh, are shifting a little bit uh, due to how the performance is in every country. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we have applauded a lot what happened in Armenia, and that is a new interest coming up for, for what, uh, the, the, uh, the development in Armenia now. And you, by that you can really see that you can attract interest and you can attract uh, uh, positive uh, uh, development if you manage yourself to sort out and, and create the, the basics for uh, democracy. Democracy is uh, not look alike all over uh, Europe, uh, but I know that uh, from, from uh, lots of, of contacts with Georgia, uh, Georgia is following quite uh, closely the Venice Commission's recommendations and that is of course uh, also something that is helpful in the Eastern Partnership, also linking quite a lot to, to uh, uh, the re recommendations from uh, Venice Commission. Thank you very much, Kirsten. And finally, last but not least, uh, our friends from Estonia. Estonia, just like Poland, has had uh, this experience of uh, pre-accession preparations, the huge reforms uh, that both you and us had to undergo. Would Estonia be where it is today in terms of democratic, uh, democratic development, if not the enlargement perspective and the enlargement itself? Well, it helped a lot, of course. Um, Estonia is one of the countries uh, that is uh, keeping the open door policy towards enlargement. Uh, I think uh, perhaps it's surprising for uh, some of you, uh, uh, you are in a better position today as Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania were in 91 because then it was not usual to think that somebody outsider, a small country like Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania will come and be a part of the European Union. Uh, then today everybody knows about uh, this process and uh, I'm not talking about uh, association agreement. So those countries who had signed this association agreement are much closer to us than those countries that only thinking what to do. And uh, we are talking about many things and I agree with my colleagues, but uh, the process is very hard. Mm -hmm. It's not simply civil society or something else. Law, the uh, rule of law, you must do everything at once. Mm -hmm. You must synchronize your law system to European um, uh, si uh, law system. And uh, when we started the process, we thought that uh, uh, we can't send all our best representatives to Brussels when we entered, uh, because nation is very small and uh, the brains are counted. So how to see and find the balance between our representatives in uh, high positions uh, in Europe and stay at home? Uh, this is uh, quite a task. Absolutely challenging. Thank you so much for this. We are slowly getting into questions. Are there already some counts? Okay, excellent. So we'll ask the microphones to be coming up. We have already three questions. But one more question just to steer up the debate. Russia. What is Russia's role in promoting or not the reforms in the Eastern Partnership countries? I see Kirsten is grabbing the microphone, please. Well, uh, not promoting democracy, rule of law and human rights. Uh, that is for sure, and you can uh, absolutely see uh, the way they are trying to undermine uh, this. They are also trying to redefine what is democracy. Democracy is freedom for people, uh, minority rights, uh, and uh, uh, rule of law is uh, uh, independent, just judiciary, and so on. But they are trying to redefine, and they are also trying to split. And I, I will also try to warn you for splitting the Eastern Partnership mm -hmm. because that could also easily be uh, one instrument uh, played for, for trying to uh, diminish because Eastern Partnership has been uh, compared to southern neighborhood policies 
Uh, Eastern Partnership has been so instrumental and so uh, uh, good. So I do think that we must make sure that keep the format Eastern Partnership and uh, don't listen to those who want to split it up or whatever. And if you want to uh, be resilient uh, towards Russia, make sure that uh, going forward on democracy, building a, a strong, independent, uh, transparent institutions, uh, judiciary, uh, civil society, uh, uh, got a lot of space for civil society, all those uh, things that Russia is trying to fight against. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, a, a very important intervention. Everybody, let's, let's uh, start with our Armenian friend because you have this balancing act to perform, so I'm very interested in your opinion. Thank you, thank you. Look, we, have, we are very patiently uh, making this point. Mm -hmm. What happened in Armenia is no geopolitics. Mm -hmm. Don't try to find anything in Armenia's domestic politics, in Armenia's transformation, in strengthening democracy, in strengthening our public institutions, that goes against our relations with Russia. Don't find color in Armenia. Don't, we, you won't. So we have been quietly and patiently explaining this to our partners who have doubts about whether democracy is a geopolitical tool. But it is not, but wait a minute. The same goes in the other direction, because I, had, I was in a condition at some point earlier last year to ask this question to my friends in Europe. Are we not sufficiently democratic to you because we're not sufficiently anti-Russian? This is not how we want to think. This is not how we think. So if Russia is brought in in the context of geopolitics, then my one word is Turkey. My security concern is Turkey. This is where the security threat comes to Armenia. 27 years of blockade, 27 years of denied justice, denied uh, relations, is creating a serious security threat to us. Let's discuss that. But does it have to do anything with democracy building in the country? Does it have to do anything about our civilization, our values and everything that we find home in Europe? We are Europe. You see what I mean? So this is this, this fine line, the difficult fine line, in which you have to build your security architecture in a way that you can protect mm -hmm. your national interest in which democracy, so far as we are concerned, we have, we have established it very clearly that democracy is part of our national security architecture. And for that we work in every direction to complement and to consolidate mm -hmm that architecture. Let me just challenge you very, very Please. shortly here. I can imagine that our Ukrainian colleagues uh, in the days, our Ukrainian colleagues, Ukraine, uh, during the days of the Euromaidan would also say to the Russians, this is not geopolitics. It has nothing to do with, with geopolitics. It is our own choice. And yet uh, they suffer until today the consequences of something that Russia saw as geopolitics has not consulted, you're not afraid of, of that type of a, a potential, potential threat? Uh, no, we're not. We have been patiently doing our job. We haven't done anything in our foreign policy that would challenge that rationale on which that the foreign policy so is So where built. did Ukraine go wrong? That I will certainly skip. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Michael, please. Well, Russia remains our neighbor. It's in our vital interest that Russia plays a constructive role on the global stage in solving regional conflicts and so on. But Eastern Europe is definitely not Mr. Putin's backyard. I'm so proud that Eastern European countries wants to share our values. And if people go on the street to demonstrate for democracy, rule of law, independence of judiciary, I'm extremely grateful. It was also the case in Armenia. It was also the case last week and today here in Georgia. I'm proud of it. But nobody, no country 
should make should make a decision between a neighbor and the European Union. That's extremely important. But and I can't agree more. Um, geopolitical interests are key, but sometimes it sounds a bit cynical. And um, it's an obligation for the European Union to make clear that we are very much interested in uh, strong, reliable relations to Russia, but never Eastern Europe has to pay the bill. Never. But this is my personal point of view, and I know that this is a very delicate issue within the European Union. You have many different point of views. But at the end, the only chance for the European Union to survive politically is that we speak with one single voice based on a common approach, a comprehensive approach, also regarding Russia. Excellent. Thank you very much. Tamar. Do you have to make a decision between the neighbor and the European um, Union? So, uh, your initial question was uh, what Russia means uh, to democracies that we are trying to build. For Georgia, Russia means um, an occupier who is occupying 20% of our territories. Um, it means uh, permanent threat and danger to our security. It means severe violation of human rights on people who are living on occupied territories. And it also means a divisive force not only uh, within the Eastern Partnership countries, but within the societies, also within the Georgian society. And through different means, through different ways, this attempt to divide within the societies, actually, is also something that is coming from Russia. And um, I agree that Europe should have um, a value-based and common approach. But unfortunately, this is not what we have seen, for example, in a Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly recently, which was a very, very frustrating experience. Unfortunately, it was mentioned here in a previous panels uh, when Russia was invited back to the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly despite all the severe violations in regards to Ukraine, in regards to Georgia, and all the Western, uh, the majority, a vast majority of the Western European states just opened the doors without, uh, without anything. Just, uh, this was, and these kind of decisions are quite confusing. So you didn't buy and, the um, argument and that... And I think that yeah. what is, what is important, what is vitally important for countries like Georgia, because we are small, we are in a very challenging neighborhood, we have neighbor who is occupying our territories and is imposing a permanent danger on us, and we are the country who aspires to be a truly democratic state and true part of the European Union. And for that, we also need, um, I think, that very clear understanding and message from the European Union that this desire to be a part of the common family is coming from the both sides because our desire is definitely there. We appreciate the very good opportunities for cooperation and engagement, and we are very much willing to see this in, um, even farther enhanced, increased, and the confusing messages that took place in the Council of Europe um, Parliamentary Assembly hopefully will be just a mm -hmm. bad example, bad lesson, that will not be something that will further continue. Thank you, Tamar. Uh, a point well taken uh, about our own walking the talk uh, and our own uh, engagement specifically here with Georgia. And uh, any Estonian uh, looks at, at, at the question? Of course, Estonia has a long history of relations with, with Russia uh, and still ongoing. Uh, please. As I mentioned before, uh, in the beginning of 90s, when Estonia wanted to become the member of the European Union, not uh, every country in Europe, especially leaders of those countries, understood why Estonia wants to join. Sometimes it seems to me that in Russia, nobody in the leadership believes why 
Estonia wanted to leave mm -hmm. the Soviet Union. So European Union has moved on and quite quickly. Russia is moving, but not so quickly. So mo we must have time, if it's possible, to negotiate because dialogue is always better than monologue. My sister served as a cultural attaché of Estonian uh, embassy in Moscow, and uh, we achieved quite good relations between cultural organizations of two countries. Uh, what comes to politics and, uh, and other issues, uh, it's, it's hard. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, we, we must always know that Russia is there. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And we have at least five, six questions. So what we're going to do is maybe take twos. Uh, here the gentleman in the first row and then here and we'll go from there. So hello. Please introduce yourself. Yes. Uh, my name is Beka Natsulishvili. I'm independent member of the parliament. So the question was how Eastern Partnership could help democracy in Eastern Partnership countries. It depends on what kind of democracy we talk. If we talk about the legalistic understanding of democracy, like rule of law and so on, it is a good, big help. But if we talk about democracy as a, in a holistic understanding of it, I a little bit doubt. Because, you know, separately, rule of law does not mean democracy. Separately, market economy does not mean democracy because democracy needs strong socioeconomic base. And in the country, for example, in Georgia, and it is not the uh, failure of Georgian government on governments. It is an objective situation. It is a country where about 25% of people live under the poverty. It is a country where 65% of working people get just 1,000 lari. Very important point, but could we yes, ask yes. a question? It is that. quite difficult to bring the people to, in the participation process. Mm -hmm. And without the participation, democracy does not work. Mm -hmm. With rule of law, without rule of law, and so mm -hmm. on. That's why it was here mentioned that the uh, collapse of Soviet Union was ge geopolitical catastrophe. It was not geopolitical catastrophe. Mm -hmm. It was right, well done that Soviet Union had collapsed. Mm -hmm. But it became humanitarian catastrophe. Okay, is there That's a why, question? And I'm so me. sorry yes. that I have to. That's why we need, we need Marshall Plan for Eastern Partnership mm -hmm. countries, or Marshall Plan for mm -hmm. Eastern Europe, because mm -hmm. collapse of Soviet Union created the same situation like after the Second World War in Europe. Thank you. That is Thank the you main very much. point, I think, I think that, what about yeah. we have to talk. Thank I you very the much. Question, the, the question generally is, is about, uh, you know, how do, we, how do we reinvigorate democracies when it comes to participation and, of course, help countries of Eastern partners. Let's take a second one as well. Yes. And we're yes. going to... Yes, yeah. Michael Gala, member of the European Parliament. Mm -hmm. um, I agree mostly to what has been described with, uh, with regard to our policies uh, that we pursue towards the Eastern Partnership. But wouldn't uh, you also agree, as we have this flexibility in our approach towards the six countries, there are those who are more ambitious and there are others who are less ambitious. And I think specifically with Armenia, we are not overcharging you. We are not demanding, God, get out of the Eurasian Customs Union, come to us. We are not doing that. And I think that is the difference between us and Russia. We leave the choice to the countries. But the question is, in, in my mind, uh, are we, um, as a union, uh, credible enough when we are uh, we want to deliver and this is the part there was the reference to the the, the, the Council of Europe where I'm also with us in the European Parliament we were a bit surprised about this unconditional not surrender uh, readmittance uh, of Russia uh, and I'm afraid that we will see in Ma April when well, allegedly there will be a checkup uh, what they have done uh, we will not see that much. But are we not inconsequent and losing our attraction to these countries who are in the next phase, not in the candidate status, when we are at the same time also not delivering even to the candidates? We are not opening to Northern Macedonia what we have 
promised. We are pushing these countries towards Russia and China. That is my fear. If we tell them Macedonians, you must rename and then you come uh, as a candidate and then we are not delivering. In this case, it's even a bit the German Bundestag. But, and even for, we are seeing it, results and conditions are met by the countries and we are not fulfilling the promise. Even yeah. inside the EU, Romania, Bulgaria have fulfilled all the, all the conditions for Schengen and we are not implementing yeah. it. So Thank even you. members are frustrated. So what is our problem here? How shall we solve that? Thank you. So actually two remarks, but uh, kind of looking inwards. Uh, on the one side, you know, how do we reinvigorate our democracy, support for, for the idea, the concept, yes, of, of, of democracy itself. And second, are we really uh, serious inside of the European Union? So do we, do we really deliver where we should be uh, delivering, not only in the Western Balkans, but in the Eastern Partnership? Anyone wants to start? Tamara, I think you wanted to, on the first question, and then... Well, I would start by uh, my colleague's point about um, economy and economic development, which is also relevant when talking about democracy, because we all understand very well that democratic values can continuously in a long-term perspective work in those societies where economy also works and where uh, the extremely poor countries, it's difficult to, it's very easy to manipulate with the poor people's opinions. And um, this is why we think that, and our opinion is that Georgia has had a progress on democratic front not perfect, obviously, a uh, lot of space for improvement and a lot remains to be done. But uh, where we think that Georgia really needs and the next good stage of engagement with the European Union is also realizing once again, once more, how the Georgia's economic strengthening can be a matter and point of cooperation because economically weak, Georgia is easy to be manipulated by Russia. And this is also something that is often used. And this is something that where we and think that the point of the this Marshall was the, plan, this yes? is the point. Yeah. So I do not know whether we call it Marshall Plan or we, we see, we call it uh, like joint vision of future cooperation, about the but Marshall something plan. particular, concrete, new benchmarks in the cooperation as we understand that we are not in the nearest future, we are not getting membership, but there should be something very clear, very obvious, also for Georgian society and for the European Union, what is the next on the table. And this is what we are working for and hopefully the EU will be open to. Thank you, Tamar. Michael. I would like to come back to the uh, European model of democracy and I can't agree more European, our European model of democracy is much more than free elections. It's linked to open, liberal and inclusive societies. We don't care about religion, we don't care about ethnicity, we don't care about sexual orientation. What we really need is a strong commitment to our common values, and these values bind everybody. But my position regarding the European Union is far away from the position and the perspective of some politicians in the European Union. And that makes my job, our job, extremely challenging. And I don't want that the European Union is going to lose credibility regarding democracy, rule of law, freedom and liberty. That's a problem. And I can't agree more with uh, my distinguished colleague from the European Parliament, Michael Gala, because uh, it's right, it's true. Enlargement is always linked to conditionality and to inclusiveness. And if a country meet, meets the criteria, it's in our interest in, to fulfill our uh, uh, obligations. And that makes it so difficult in Southern and Eastern Europe. 
Um, and I'm very unhappy to see that countries like Albania or North Macedonia met the criteria, but we are not willing or not able to fulfill our part of the deal. And that is a really, really, really difficult and also dangerous situation for the European Union and for the stability of whole Europe. Thank you very much. Sarah. Thank you. Thank you very much. In fact, uh, a very difficult, challenging question has been raised about the uh, socio-economic support to values. Uh, in the first panel, I think there were some very interesting debates about the retreat of democracy, the challenges to democracy, human rights, which have become such a cheap currency in international relations. This is all heartbreak. This is all very true. Socioeconomic, I mean, we are all looking in different ways about the way in which we can consolidate our development agenda. Now, to what, exchange we, to, to what extent we compromise our values is the consistent challenge. There are other new partners, so to say, new opportunities, new avenues opening up for socioeconomic diversity and diversification and development, which the question of conditionality is pushed to the back. Values are not important. Now, this is a serious challenge to all of us. As I, and now I'm saying this is not about the European Union, Eastern Partners, this is about the whole of Europe. And this is a very difficult question. European Union has been with Armenia for 28 years. We know the value of, the value of this very in, enhanced, very, very enhanced and comprehensive relationship that we have with the European Union over 28 years. Uh, for this 28 years, which is the name of our agreement. Interestingly, uh, and it was a very, you know, uh, a relationship of maturity and, 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 and true friendship that uh, we have been able to negotiate this particular agreement, which is basically everything but the DCFTA, everything association but the DCFTA. You know, we have, con con we have defined to ourselves this diversity of socio-economic development, diversity of entries to markets. We have had to deal with geopolitics. So those are, those are the realities that we, the small nations, Georgia has been speaking exactly, our colleagues, she mentioned the, 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 the difficulty of a small nation, the challenge of a small nation. So how to stick to your values while at the same time to position yourself in, those, in this global turbulence that is happening. And Europe as a place of values, as a place of uh, you know, a common home where we share, we do believe in that, is uh, I think the debate, whether it is Eastern Partnership, it's one of the platforms, a very important platform of community, as I was saying, Communi sense of a community. Well, the use of this platform in the broader context of how we deal with the, the challenges to what we call common values is uh, what's going to chase us in these coming years. Thank, Thank you. you. Kirsten, do you agree? Well, I, I think we will have a, a big discussion about the values and uh, what we really are meaning when using the words. Uh, and uh, it's clear there is a competition on, on uh, what it's really all about. Uh, but I, celebrating, as we are in, from Swedish uh, Riksdag the, in the parliament, we are celebrating 100 years of, uh, since we had uh, f the, the rights to vote for uh, women as well as male, men. And uh, this uh, celebration goes uh, in the same direction as uh, Georgia's independence celebration, actually. But, it That's takes... why we have uh, gender parity on this panel, you yeah, know, yeah. thinking about this. Great, because we, we need to make it the inclusiveness in the society and, and make sure that the whole society is uh, uh, with us. I fully agree with this. Uh, it's not the election day that uh, constitutes uh, democracies. It's the whole environment and how you can include uh, people your citizens in, into the society in everyday life. And that, is, that goes back to, uh, to the civil society, also met with them before. And of course, it is important to have this uh, civil society. And Georgia has a, a strong civil society 
uh, and a broad civil society, and that is also important to bring them with, uh, to build democracy. And to build uh, democracy is a fight every day. Uh, but I think what we have seen, I mean, we was, we was a poor country as well in Sweden 100 years ago. Uh, it was possible to change and go for democracy. And as we see it, that was the way forward for us. Mm -hmm. Also for the economy, because we, we made uh, opportunities for all. Mm -hmm. No matter, you didn't have to leave the country mm -hmm. to live your dream. And that is what it's all about. Thank you very much. And please. Yes, I think that uh, Marshall Plan was inevitable in Europe after the war. It helped Germany a lot, it helped Europe, it gave the possibility to move on quicker. I think the Marshall Plan is uh, ready and of, of course working even today for countries like Georgia, Armenia, Moldova and so on. Of course we do not call it Marshall Plan but uh, always every country that is helping those countries is giving their share of uh, not only financial but uh, all the other possibilities how to move quicker. Uh, what comes to, to the other point then uh, every leader of uh, countries like Georgia, Armenia, they must support the idea of becoming a member country in the European Union. In Estonia, when we argued about whether to join the European Union or not, uh, not everybody was eager to join. We had even a movement, uh, paragraph one of the Constitution of Estonia. Estonia is an independent, free country. And the question was whether Estonia will be independent after joining the European Union. My counter question was always, Look, is Finland independent after joining the European Union? Of course. Then why do you think that in Estonia the case will be different? It's very important that the leaders will support that. In Estonia, our president and speaker of parliament, they worked a lot to move Estonia ahead, to change the opinion. Everybody was ready for NATO in Estonia. Mm -hmm. Today, the support of the European Union in Estonia is something like 80%. Mm -hmm. It was not in the beginning. But of course, pushing mm -hmm. is not yeah. good. We must give good examples from the countries of uh, European Union. Thank you. We understand yeah. that we are not always mm -hmm. very successful in producing good examples, but we try. Thank you, Anne. Okay, we really need to speed up. We have 15 minutes. What I'm going to do now is we're going to take four questions, especially those who were raising their hands the earliest. So we have from civil society Maria here, we have the gentleman here, the third gentleman there on the left who was really fighting, and I think we had here, uh, so uh, please focus on the questions, okay? We need to really focus on the questions and then, then I'll ask you to just choose the questions you feel most strongly about. Maria, please. Uh, not from civil society anymore, I'm from the Latvian parliament, but nevertheless. Um, I, I'm going to speak about civil society. Mikhail Roth mentioned that there is a frustration in the civil society. Now, all six Eastern Partnership countries have robust civil societies. Some are faring better, some worse. We know in Belarus and Azerbaijan there are great difficulties. Um, there is, of course, a formal structure for participation, civil society forum for Eastern Partnership countries. I was on the board myself. Um, but if I may, and I think I can say that exactly because I was on the board, it is a little bit of a participation playground or participation ghetto. And what we have are hugely competent and robust civil societies that have been underutilized in democratic reforms. I remember rooms as big as this, full of people with huge policy expertise in Ukraine in 2014, after the Euromaidan. Very few of those people were able to become, you know, advisors or experts. The government would engage in real reform work. Uh, some of them had to become politicians to be heard. The same in some other countries, including Georgia. So my question to you all is, how can we reinvigorate uh, the participation of civil society for real? 
to utilize this huge potential that civil society Excellent. has. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Underutilization of civil society, please. Uh, just behind you, if you can pass on the yeah. mic. Thank you. My question to uh, our European uh, colleagues. My name is Georgi Baramidze. I'm representing United Opposition. Unfortunately, in, during this conference, uh, we don't have any of us representing opposition uh, mm -hmm. among the panelists. Uh, so uh, it's very unfortunate that we cannot uh, give you a full picture from our side of the Georgian democracy. And my question is that, uh, are you aware that this country indeed not ruled by those people who you listened this morning, but the informal uh, ruler that is, that is a uh, ethnic Georgian, but the Russian oligarch. And can we talk about really in these circumstances uh, about the democracy? Um, I'm an ex vice prime minister responsible for European and Euro Atlantic integration during eight years of previous government. And uh, I remember how vigorously we've got your support by giving us advices and uh, offering us adequate scrutiny. Do we think that nowadays Georgia is getting this help through the scrutiny, objective scrutiny, and which includes also public criticism? Mm -hmm. Nobody heard, heard uh, uh, listened these young people today among mm -hmm. this uh, conference, except opposition, what they are demanding. And all, uh, all of you, you. So probably question, know. The question is about democratic question, scrutiny. The question mm -hmm. is that whether you think that the uh, scrutiny of the Georgia's democracy is enough, and you consider this country, which is ruled by the oligarch informally, is a, is a democracy, which is compatible with the European standards. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, there, the gentleman on the left, because I think he was. Thank you. Um, I am a representative of the civil society. My organization's name is Georgia's Reforms Associates. I too been observing for quite some time certain alarming developments uh, in Georgia in terms of or in the context of democratic institution building. And my question would be to Minister Roth. Uh, it didn't give me a pleasure at all, so to speak, uh, when you raised your criti criticism toward uh, the governments, including government in Georgia and authorities in Georgia uh, uh, over, over, over their uh, uh, reforms and democratic institution building or a backsliding in the context of democratic institution building. But could you be more specific, please, what else you can tell to the authorities on the one hand, to the political opposition as well as to the civil society in order to have in order not to have Georgia derail, to, 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 to derail completely from its democratic development and in order to deliver more and in order not to find itself where, for instance, uh, our partner Moldova found itself some time ago uh, when, for instance, the European Union was forced even to freeze its uh, economic assistance. Um, second question, very no, briefly. No, 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 one, one, because then somebody's going to lose that question. One, one. question, yeah, but sorry. To to another, per to another person. Thank you. <laughs> During the break. All very right. happy to take on. Thanks. And we have also here one question. Mogis Salmevit, Sabatriarchos, Sazo Godobostan, Urtir Tobis, Samsakurus, Kams, Do we have translation? May I translate here? Oh, yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, here's uh, Father Andrea Jarmaidze. He's head of the uh, George's Patriarchy uh, uh, Public Relation uh, Service. Mogex and Debat Sakartolos, that it's Eliaris. I am Zazem Modis Archeolia of Tasauletis Hire Bulebe Vizgazia Rebada Tasauletisaken Zoga that Motroba. Sakartolo, Erti Piroli Respublica, Romelitz, Sapchuta Kaushiris, Tangrevisas, Piroli, a protest of the eight hundred thousand plebs. It's almost thirty years that Georgia took the way to the Europe, this uh, Western uh, way, and Georgia was one of the first uh, republic of former Soviet Union who demanding the uh, independence from Soviet Union. Erterti Mizezi, Ris Ramats Gachina, Sakartolos 
დამოუკიდებლობისაკენ ბრძოლის სული იყო ალბათ ის დროს საბჭოთა კავშირი არ ითვალისწინებდა ქართული ქართულ ფუნდამენტურ ფასეულობებს one of the reason why the georgia soul was so strong to demanding independence it was that the uh, the soviet union undermining the the values of the georgian society georgian people da qolastvi tsnobelia 1999 tlis movlenebi rodesats tankeba gaiares tbilisi tsentrshi da iqo mskhverpli kartul mosakhleobas mosakhleobas shoris and it was uh, it's it's well known that uh, in 1989 uh, when the uh, soviet tanks uh, uh, went through the main prospect of the uh, tbilisi and uh, uh, there was uh, people who died aman kide upro gaazliera protesti ara tu shiamtsira and that fact more strengthened the protest of the georgian people uh, unless the We need to ask a question because we have 5 minutes to close the panel. Chen khedaut cheni mosakhlobis polarizatsias. Erti zalian tkivneuli sakitkhis garshemo. And now we are uh, we see the polarization of Georgian uh, people on one particular issue. Sakme imashia ro kartuli kulturisatvis utsku aris tsxorebis intimuri detalebis demonstrireba rogoric ar unda iqos es It's uh, for for Georgian culture it's uh, not usual not very welcome the demonstration of the uh, private life But is there a question uh, for the panelists Chuen va ambobt rom sakartoloshi LGBT xalxtis tsinaamdeg არ არსებობს აგრესია მანამ სანამ ისინი საკუთარი ცხოვრების წესის დემონსტრირებას არ იწყებენ. Uh, we are saying that, that there is no, no aggression against LGBT community in Georgia before they are not popularized they are or showing their uh, private life. და იმის გათვალისწინებით რომ რუსეთის ზრდილი ძალის ხელში ძალიან ნოყიერ ნიადაგს ქმნის ეს თემა and having in mind that, that this uh, topic uh, it's quite used by the russian soft power chuen zalian goatsukhebs es da utsvam chekitkhvas last word ramdenat ramdenat didi mnishneloba aks da ikneba tu ara kategoriuli motkhona sakartolos tsinaagndek sakartolos tsinashe rom mzgavsi aktsiebi praidebi da ase shemdek ganhortsieldes mis kuchebshi and here is the question how how important is that how uh, the georgian society would face demand from the west or from the eu uh, that the, it should be allowed this kind of rights uh, of the uh, lgbt uh, community okay so the question about values again but this time conservative versus liberal values uh, and the question of 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 uh, lgbt who wants to start kirsten i'll start for you i don't have to tell you we have uh, five minutes one minute per person but take your time please well uh, actually uh, scrutiny first uh, i think it is important for scrutiny uh, and to be helpful and i think also that has been a lesson inside the eu uh, that we uh, we must make sure that we have scrutinized efficiently uh, the, the, how the implementation have been done on criteria before becoming a member, before going forward, and not taking just a political decision. And that is part of, of uh, the discussion as well. So I think it is important. Civil society, uh, much more to be done and much more to include and make it uh, not with the elbow, but really uh, take civil society in i think that is important to build strong societies and there are different models out there to do it uh, and i know that georgia is trying but could be more of course uh, the question of the the lgbt for us and uh, it's a question of uh, fundamental rights for people uh, be it uh, religious be it uh, uh, ethnic or be it uh, uh, political or be it sexual orientation or whatever it's a question of human rights and, and fundamental rights so when we are talking about that it's it's how we have to build tolerant societies respectful societies 
And if you respect me, I respect you. And, and that is what I think is uh, so important uh, for our societies. Michael, I feel you want to add to this. Thank you. Um, I, I prefer frank, open discussions. I'm a religious person and I'm very much engaged in my church, but there is a misunderstanding, and I know this misunderstanding from my conversations with Russian politicians. Um, human rights are international rights, and you should never make a distinction between an Eastern traditional interpretation of human rights and Western-oriented interpretation. And it bears a special responsibility, not just for the political or the, for the economic elite, but also for churches to strengthen societies which express respect and tolerance to minorities, especially LGBTI. And there are no excuses if representatives of churches accuse ethnic, religious, or sexual minorities in public. This is totally unacceptable. Thank you, Michael. Zarab. Thank you very much. Two points I just wanted to focus on. First, on civil society. I think, uh, you know, so far as civil society is concerned, the, the uh, uh, focus of civil society domestically, I think, is an ex the priority. In our case, civil society, well, basically you can't escape them because they are part of the overall public debate, decision-making, you cannot escape that. In, uh, the civil, in, the, in the context of SEPA, we found and we are exploring this new method in which we're trying to move from uh, general debates about the way in which we should implement SEPA to uh, working groups in which we can uh, bring forward the experts from the civil society into the collective assessment of how we move forward with the implementation. So at the local, at the national level, the, uh, the, uh, the focus is, is absolute priority. On the other question about values and about uh, how we perceive them. Now, look, I think, you know, we, we have to remind ourselves that absolutely, we talk about human rights, we talk about the value of the human in this. I represent a nation which knows what it is to be discriminated. On the, in our case, it was the religious ethnic group, the minority which has been persecuted 105 years ago, which still faces that you know, denied justice. We know what is discrimination. Now, if you ask me, I will tell you discrimination on any grounds is not acceptable. We are going collectively, it's not about East and West. Perhaps we might remind ourselves that only 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I was still working in some parts of Western Europe where pubs were burnt down because gays and lesbians were gathering in those particular pubs, that homosexuality was a criminal act until very recently in many parts of Europe, East or West. So it's a phenomenon, it's something that it's, it's a public, co collective public debate which is happening in the past 40 years. It's a, it's, it's a new thing that we should admit it. In the, in the post-Soviet part, it's even a newer thing to debate this publicly, to bring this, or to decriminalize it. In Armenia, we decriminalize it on the way to the accession to the, human, uh, the Council of Europe. You know, so it is a public. Yes, there are such things as national values, tradition, and so on and so forth. Anything, anyone who would argue on the count of tradition to uh, you know, support discrimination is not going to work. Anything to insist that this, this has to be accepted uni universally, di disregarding national debate, imposing it without regard to what is happening within the national debate, it has to be homegrown. This is a national debate. In every particular case, it's a different debate. One final thing. We have also to focus on some fundamentals. We are going in compartment compartmentalization 
of human rights, and we spoke about LGDP. Why didn't anyone bring up the question of other minority groups, like the disabled, and so on and so forth? You know, is this a fashion we are following? No, we shouldn't do that. We should be very careful about looking at discrimination in all its entirety, religious groups, ethnic groups, national groups, and also specifically about the fundamental human rights. We can, we can trip, we can be flexible for our, whether it is geopolitics, whether it is national, you know, socioeconomic interest, energy interest, and so on, to disregard freedom of uh, assembly, freedom of the media. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we have to focus on the fundamentals, Thanks, not to forget about that. Point Thank well you. taken. And the last one minute for you, I'm right. so sorry, please, and Scrutiny, monitoring, it means helping. Estonia has two specialists in Tbilisi, monitoring and helping your progress. What about uh, human rights? I'm old enough to remember things. I was in Tbilisi 30 years ago. The next day, the terrible massacre took place in Tbilisi. Human rights then were violated by spades of Soviet soldiers. I worked then in Estonian television and uh, I made reports of that tragedy. Today you live in different conditions, but it doesn't mean that you must fight for your rights. Thank you very much, Tamar. The final point, anything you want to add which well, has not been said very, yet? Just very, very briefly point about the civil society and mm -hmm. the role of it because I myself have years of experience mm -hmm. representing a civil society. I have mm -hmm. full appreciation of the role that civil society is playing in the democratic progress and Georgia does have a very vibrant civil society and sometimes we agree, sometimes we disagree, sometimes we manage to do some good things together, sometimes we fight a lot. But at the end of the day, um, Georgian civil society does have a big influence and this is what matters and this is what is important. Perfect. On this note, we will be finishing the panel. Sorry, we don't have a time to summarize, but let's maybe summarize with a kind of little polling I would want to do here. We've just had a gentleman from the opposition speaking. I'll be happy to speak to you after, but this is not, I'm not the organizer. De ladies and gentlemen, one, one last, one last uh, poll kind of feeling. Uh, how many of you truly believe that when we meet here in 10 years, so for the 20th anniversary of the Eastern Partnership Initiative, uh, we will have... Uh, I, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very sorry, I'm very sorry, but we just, we just had a gentleman from the opposition speaking. There was a lady in the first panel speaking from the opposition. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to uh, conclude here. Uh, thank you so much for, to our panelists, and thank you for uh, the wonderful audience and questions.